Hello, everybody. So welcome to PolyU online lecture series, um, a crash course into coffee basics. I'm Jonathan Sutton, and I'm teaching you today. So a few questions for you to think about first before we get started, um, which hopefully you can answer at the end of this lecture series. So the first one is geographically, where does coffee come from? Number two, uh, what are two important stages of coffee before we consume or drink the beverage? And the last question is, what are two different methods of extraction? So today we'll concentrate definitely on one of those methods. So about the course today. Okay, so today's class, very, very simple. We're talking about coffee basics. So quick history lesson. Where did coffee come from? Where is it grown? What are the different kinds of coffees that we can grow? Um, what are the main stages of coffee and its production? How can we process the seed, or sometimes we call the bean? Um, what's the roasting process? Uh, what are the different extraction methods? And the last one that we'll be doing is looking at making espresso. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the map first. So actually coffee first originated from a few different places um, and actually a lot of people don't really know where it came from. But the history books and most people confirm that Arabica coffee, which is a kind of um, species of coffee, first originated from Ethiopia. Right? So that's on the continent of Africa. So if you look at the top map on the right side in the middle, you'll see Ethiopia. Um, actually coffee then spreads across the water um, to the first place which was Yemen and actually Yemen was the first place that they said cultivated coffee. So Ethiopia used to grow wild um, so underneath some different trees and people used to pick it sporadically um, and then the first place to cultivate coffee was Yemen. From there actually it spread up through the Middle East um, eventually into Europe via the, um, the Ottoman Empire. Um, and also across into Asia to now what would be known as Indonesia, um, and then eventually over to Central and South America too. So then where is coffee mostly grown? So if you know a little bit about wine, we have wine belts. Coffee has its own belts, which is middle to the equator area. Okay. So this is quite important because the equator has a relatively stable climate, so the temperature doesn't fluctuate too much. It remains fairly warm. Uh, we get a good amount of rainfall too. So apart from that, we also try and look for another variable, which is a little bit to do with heights. So good soil and good heights is also good for making or growing coffee. We'll go to the next slide. So here is a little bit of a quick breakdown of some different kinds of coffees that we can find. But most of the coffees that I'm sure that you will see or advertised which will probably be Arabica coffee, will be from the middle of that tree. Um, actually, a lot of the cheap coffee that you consume, so instant coffee, will be towards the right side, so the Canifera or Robusta kind of coffee. Um, and just a quick fact for you guys, Robusta actually has about four times as much caffeine than one cup of Arabica coffee. So if you have one cup of Robusta, all right, your instant Nescafe is probably a Robusta coffee, that's probably equal to drinking four cups from Starbucks. Okay, so quite a big difference. So actually our coffee is quite wide, um, and today we're just looking at Arabica coffee in the middle. Go to the next. Now at the, the seed, or sometimes we call it the coffee bean, but it is a seed because actually it sits in the middle of a fruit. So the outside when the coffee cherry is ripe, it will change color from green. Um, sometimes it will turn yellow um, and often it will turn red. So when it's red, we know that the inside hopefully is sucked up enough nutrients and it should have enough sugar inside. Um, and that means that we should have a good product that we can then process and try and look to roast. So if you're looking at the cherry, our picture has a cross section. Um, most cherries normally have two seeds inside, but not all. Some only have one. Okay. So if you're looking at the cross section, we're trying to get that green bit from the insides. So the next thing we're going to do is to show you guys how to roast.
So we've got a small little roaster here, um, and we've got some of our green or seeds. Okay, and we're actually going to place those inside this small roaster. And we'll let that roast. So while we let that roast, hopefully it should be done by the end of this session. And we'll have a look at the change in color. So hopefully we should see a change from the green color, which is the inside of the coffee bean or the seeds. Um, and it should be roasting free and hopefully come out a different color at the end. We'll go back to our slides now. And we'll look at some of the main stages of coffee. OK, so one of those questions that we asked you earlier is uh, some of the main stages or main main uh, parts of coffee before we drink. So we've got the growing, um, and actually here you've got a picture about the altitude. So when you go up, when you grow coffee higher and higher, okay, actually sometimes we get a bit of a change in the kind of flavor. So coffee which is grown lower down generally has a bit of an earthy kind of taste, sometimes like a cereal as well. And as we go higher and higher in altitude, we get different kinds of flavors, some lemons, some limes, and even some floral kinds of flavors as well. So these might be really interesting if we try and extract, because you might be able to taste these uh, later, depending on the altitude. So Hong Kong is actually close to the equator. Hong Kong does have coffee, which is grown, but uh, obviously we don't grow a lot of coffee because the price of uh, land in Hong Kong is extremely expensive. Um, and also labor is very, very expensive as well. OK, so actually, if these things were cheaper, Hong Kong would be a great place to grow. Um, so you can think about some places in Hong Kong, maybe places like Tai Mo Shan, uh, which would have quite a big altitude. So I think Tai Mo Shan is about 900 meters. So it'd be in that medium altitude range. So after we have grown our coffee, um, we then look to, to process the bean. Okay. So the next part is just a few examples of some of these beans. So hopefully it's nice and red, it's ripe. Um, we've then got a few options. We can let it dry out in the sun, um, which most people do, and the color will turn a little bit darker, sometimes go a little bit black, um, or we might put the water over it straight away. So the two main processes that we have, we have one which is natural, OK, which uses almost no water, sometimes no water at all. And the other side is using a lot of water. So after you remove the outside of the husk, so that cherry, OK, if you're using a lot of water to wash it, obviously you're only going to taste the inside of the seeds, so what the coffee is sucked up inside. On the other side, if you're letting it ferment naturally or you're letting it dry naturally, you're going to get some residual sugar left over on the outside too. So our green bean, OK, um, if it's a natural method, might have some residual sweetness on the outsides. When we go to roast it, that residual sweetness might also caramelize a little bit as well. So it might give us two dimensions of flavor. And if we go the washed variety, we're only going to taste the inside. inside. So our roasting, which we have started already, so we said that we've gone from a green bean and actually roasting coffee is similar to popcorn. OK, actually it pops two times after the first crack or the first pop. The coffee is actually ready to be drunk. So we can stop the roasting earlier or we can keep on roasting further, further down and try and stop it before it becomes charcoal. OK, you wouldn't want to put charcoal inside your drink. Wouldn't taste very nice. But quite often when you get an espresso, uh, maybe from uh, like an Italian style espresso or a French roast, the roast color will be very, very dark. So traditionally this was done with very cheap coffee to try and hide a lot of the bad flavor. OK, but now as we're getting better picking methods, um, a lot of people are starting to stop the roasting process a little bit earlier. So when you walk into a shop and you see somebody who says dark roast or light roast, OK, then actually this should indicate how much they have roasted the bean. There's some examples of this. So here at the school, what we do is we use some programs to, to roast our beans. 
um, and we use power, which is the heat. We use the drum speed, so how quickly does it turn around, and we use a fan as well. And the differences between the heats on the inside of the drum and the outside of the drum is called our rate of rise. Okay, so when we're cooking, actually it's quite important to make sure we don't just cook the outside, but we cook the outside and the insides, and they should be cooked evenly. So if you imagine you're cooking a piece of beef and the inside is still still rare and the outside is burnt, when you eat it, you actually taste two different parts. So what we want to do to try and give the consistency a nice even um, kind of uh, extraction is to make sure the inside and the outside is similar. So that's why the, the roasting process can be a little bit difficult sometimes. So coming close to some of the last slides before we do the demonstration. So then when we have our roasted beans, um, we would then look into the extraction process. So there's lots of different ways that we can take the roasted coffee, we can grind it up, and then we can use different methods to try and extract. So on your screen there, you have a few examples. See if you can guess some of them. So the top left one is what we'd call a French press or a plunger coffee. The next one across is an aero press. The next two are fairly similar. So normally we call this a Chemex or a V60 or a pour over. Very, very popular now in Hong Kong. Um, and then the bottom left side, which we're going to do a quick demonstration later, is our espresso machine. Not espresso, which I realize is a spelling mistake at the start of these slides. So correct me for that one. Um, and then we have a mocha pot or a stove top. We have a siphon and we have a filter at the end. So all of these are both good and bad, depends on your preference, um, but generally what happens with these extractions is the more kind of pressure we have means the, the more oil, the more richness we get out of it as well. So quickly just talking about the drinks themselves. So when you go into a coffee shop, the first thing that you need to know is to extract your espresso. So espresso is generally about 30 ml um, of, of liquids, and then we're looking to foam the milk. If we have more foam, we'll normally end up with a drink like a cappuccino, might put a bit of chocolate over the top. Cafe latte, a little bit less foam, normally about one finger inside. And no milk, and just filling it up with hot water would be Americano or Long Black. But let's get into the espresso um, example for you guys. Okay, so we've got our machine over here and it's ready to go. So we can just make sure the water is ready to come out. Um, we've got our group handle, and I've actually filled this up already. So inside we have ground coffee, and we have two spouts, so we can extract two cups. Um, this chamber inside, or the group heads, is a double, so we should be getting two shots of coffee out of this one. So I can lock this into the machine, make sure it's nice and tight, Take my two glasses, put them underneath, and turn it on. And what I'm doing is I'm actually counting, and if I have ground this properly, it should take about 20 seconds to get roughly about 30 ml from either side. Okay. If it comes out too quickly, then I can change my grind size to a little bit smaller. And if it comes out too fast, do the reverse. So I'm just going to stop it there. A little bit under. Take that out of the group head over here. And then the next stage that we can do is also to froth the milk. So we've got our steam ones. We'll just give it a quick purge. The reason that I'm doing this is if you work in a coffee shop, quite often this will leave some milk inside. And so the next time you go to make, actually you'll have some old milk still left inside, which will go into your cup. So you always want to make sure you flush or purge the, the one. So I'm adding basically steam inside here. The closer I pull it to the top, the more foam we will get. If I pull it out of the top, I'm going to get lots of big bubbles. I don't really want big bubbles. We want micro foam. And if I'm happy with my amount of foam, 
and the heat, as soon as it becomes too hot for my hands, then I'll turn it off. So it's now becoming too hot, so off it goes. So you might be able to hear my coffee roasting is starting to pop. So at this stage here, actually, we are okay to, to stop it as well. You can see a bit of the smoke coming up as well. So I will turn this off and just pull out some of the roasted beans. And actually the last thing we have in here should be a little fan. Not on at the moment, but that will just cool down a little bit. So I go back to my coffee. So I swirl around my jug. I'm going to put my hand over, try and bang out a lot of the big bubbles. And the reason I'm doing that is actually I want the top to go really waxy. Okay. So they say normally very good coffee will be nice and waxy. And if you add a sugar on the top, it might take one or two seconds to fall free. That means your micro bubbles are really, really good. What also is going to happen inside this jug is the foam will eventually settle to the top and the textured milk will fall to the bottom. Okay, so if we had a little bit more time, we'd be able to let that settle. And as we pour, we're actually getting a lot of foam. So I'm just going to transfer this one across. Use a spoon and hold back a lot of the foam so that we can get a good latte. All right, so latte should be about one finger. So when we're getting closer to the top, use the back of the spoon. Okay, and you hold out your little finger like this, measure the top, one shot of espresso, inside textured milk, this is what we call a very, very good latte. Okay, so we'll go to the question section. So a few of the questions that we were asking before. So where was uh, coffee geographically from? Um, actually, the first one was Ethiopia. So you should be able to remember that. Um, we'll ask the, the participants as well. So. What are two of the important stages before we drink coffee? Okay, and somebody just wrote in. Very good. Okay, so one of those processes was to make sure that it grows properly. Another person said that the picking needs to be good, so making sure you pick the red or the ripe cherries. Somebody said that you need to roast at least till it pops to the first crack as well. Um, and as you saw as well, when I'm making my coffee, Obviously, the barista who's making the coffee is also very, very important. So I hope you guys enjoyed the talk today. I just like to cite some sources that we had. But if you're interested, these are some of the sources that I used to conduct uh, this lecture today. Okay. So we're, we're back with a few more of the questions. Um, takes a little bit of time for the, the system to update. So the first question was uh, from somebody asking about an Italian style of coffee which was spicy, and they were asking why. Um, probably the, the most uh, logical answer to that would be the bean itself and where it was grown. Um, if it wasn't that, it wouldn't be anything else to do with the roasting process maybe there might have been something that dropped inside the Nespresso pods as well. Um, but spice is not normally a big characteristic of coffee. The second one is about bitterness. Um, so why is coffee bitter? Um, there's two reasons for that. Actually, when you have coffee, when I extract it, normally the first part is salty, the second part is sour, then it goes sweet, and if I over extract, I normally extract acids, which is what is normally related to bitterness. So out of a coffee bean, 30% can be dissolved. The first 20% is salt, sour, and sweet. 
the last 10%, which is normally what we associate with negative stuff, not so good, not ideal flavors, is normally bitter. However, when you roast later or longer, you often get more bitterness as well. So do we have any other, any other questions? So why do we want to roast coffee light? Um, the answer to that is when it's growing, when you roast your, your bean or your seeds, just like when you're cooking something, if you have very good beef and you roast it or you cook it for a long time, you're not going to taste a lot of the flavor inside the beef. Okay? You're just going to taste a lot of the burnt, charcoal-y kind of flavors inside. Same with coffee. If you have a very, very interesting coffee that's been grown at maybe a very high altitude, maybe you want to you want to roast it a little bit lighter to try and get a little bit of the different flavors that are inside the actual bean. Generally, when we, we roast lighter, we normally get a little bit more sourness as well. Um, and the last one, so how long can the bean be stored after it's ground? Uh, this is a very contentious question, all right? Um, if you go to some coffee professionals, they'll say 30 seconds. Um, for most people, you won't be able to taste the difference in the flavor. So it does degrade, but actually what you're used to. Um, so sometimes if you have coffee powder, you can keep it up to maybe two weeks, anywhere up to maybe six months, all right? But what happens after you roast and you roast the bean is actually for the first two weeks, it will degas. So it is letting out a lot of um, gas, and a lot of that gas sometimes people associate with aromatics and flavor as well. So ideally, if you have a very, very good coffee and you roast it really well, you want to let it settle for two weeks to calm down, or at least three days, let's say. And then after that period, you can, you can grind it, and you'll get a very good aroma and also be able to taste the flavors. Okay, next one, how can we grow a better coffee bean which will taste better? It's a very good question. Um, when you know the answer, come and tell me. Um, but basically, this is like anything, if you go to the supermarket, people are always trying to grow better things, but your preference of what you like may be a little bit different. So the different variety that you have might have a different kind of characteristic, different flavor. And then where you grow it might also alter that, that flavor as well. So people who grow good stuff, grow good stuff. You can backtrack and you can try and find out why. But quite often it's to do with um, the allowing the nutrients to be sucked up um, and also some of the picking methods that they have as well. Okay, next one. Without adding any sugar or milk. I would like to ask why coffee is bitter in taste without adding. Okay, so like I said before, a lot of the bitterness happens if you over extract your coffee. So if you've got different methods of extraction, your espresso normally we will put in anywhere between seven to nine grams traditionally for one shot. Now we go up to maybe 22 grams for one shot, but we run the water only for maybe 20 seconds to 30 seconds. If I go over 30 seconds, the water has too much contact with the bean or the ground coffee, and you end up with a very bitter flavor afterwards. So if you go to very cheap coffee places, um, if you have coffee which has been brewing for a long time, generally it's a lot more bitter. Fantastic. So thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coffee basics. Um, feel free to try and contact us or contact me um, if you want to find out some more.